OK, thank you. Um, I'm not going to talk about my work in fashion uh, today, but if anyone wants to talk about it over lunch, I'm happy to indulge that curiosity. Um, so I am at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. We're the new kids on the block. This is our model. Um, top level goal is to enable and accelerate basic biomedical science research. We do that through some combination of giving out grants um, and also building out open source software tools. And I sort of sit in the middle of this. Um, we firmly believe that um, in sort of collaborative work. And so the computational biology team, we sort of work uh, with our fundees um, to understand what their problems are and how they can be solved with software, if that's possible. And then we work with our internal tech team to actually build out those software pipelines. Um, and I'll tell you today about one project that I'm deeply involved in that um, is a good model of this model. Uh, which is called the Human Cell Atlas Project. So the main idea here, you can think of it as the spiritual successor to the Human Genome Project. So the idea is to profile the order of 30 trillion cells in uh, the human body and to do this across uh, a diverse set of people. And um, the basic underlying biology question here is that if all cells have the same DNA, what on earth makes them different? So here I'm showing you sort of four kinds of cells, a neuron all the way to um, skeletal cells, cardiac cells, and smooth muscle cells. So we know all of these cells are rather different. They're also localized in different parts of your body, right? Your heart cells in your heart, and your neurons are in your brain. Um, and they actually like look very different. And you know, this is you know, answering this question is is super interesting. Um, we have sort of one path into this. Uh, which is the central dogma of biology, molecular biology, which asserts that, um, sure, all cells have access to the same DNA, but uh, they might be transcribing that DNA differently um, into mRNA molecules. These things code for genes, and some of these genes code for proteins. Uh, and so that mRNA is translated into a sequence of polypeptides, which then form an actual protein. And so somewhere in here is where the magic is about um, what are the different cell types in the human body. And um, along these axes, there's many ways to profile um, using experimental methods, data that come from these various stages of the central dogma. And so you can sort of profile the mRNA, that's called transcriptomics. You can profile the proteins, that's called proteomics. Uh, and then you can also um, look at sort of DNA chromatin accessibility, um, all the way at the top there. And what we want to do is sort of build out a data coordination platform that for every cell will allow access to these multimodal measurements of the cell. And uh, I should say, even in addition to this central dogma, you can even look at the actual morphology of these cells, as I alluded to earlier. So we're going to generate a bunch of imaging data for this project. Um, so the data cl collaboration platform, this is a uh, the data coordination platform is a collaboration between um, us at CZI, UC Santa Cruz, um, the Broad Institute, and EBI. And the basic idea is we'll have labs that are generating data at various stages um, and of various modalities. That gets ingested into some sort of ingestion layer, which is then stored across multiple clouds. We will um, expose pipelines that can take your raw data and um, spit back out analyzed data, which goes back into the same place. Um, and all of these data will be open and freely available for researchers to work on. And so you know, I sort of intuitively think about this as the control experiment. So if you're a physician and you have access to samples that are in a diseased state, you might want to know, well, what the heck should these cells look like? Um, and one possible plan of attack there is to access um, these data portals to take a look at in healthy individuals what ought this to be to help guide a potential intervention. Um, I should say I'm not a clinician, so I apologize to those in the room where that's uh, uh, made a mistake there. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about um, transcriptomics works. So this is profiling the mRNA of, um, of cells. These technologies sort of um, have really taken off since the early 2000s, um, and then the field's starting to get very interesting. Um, so in profiling um, RNA for the human cell atlas, there's roughly two different branches. So you know they all start off here. So if I take an individual and I look at their intestine, uh, I now have cells from one region. And there's kind of two main um, technologies for profiling the RNA in these cells. 
In single cell RNA sequencing, you take the cells out of their spatial context, so they're completely dissociated from the tissue. They're exploded out, you get access to all the RNA molecules, and you pass that through a machine that then sequences those molecules. So at the end of the day, your, your sort of data output there is a matrix, very simple. Each row in this matrix is a cell, and each column in that matrix is a gene, and each element of that matrix is the number of times you've observed a copy of that gene in that cell. Um, these methods are really great. They're super high throughput. You get a ton of uh, cells for cheap, um, and you get all of the genes that are profiled. But the big problem is you lose spatial information. So here, in these image-based techniques, you basically get to have your cake and eat it too. And as we know, you know spatial information is super important because cells are spatially organized. This is an example of the intestinal epithelium, where you have um, cells organized into crypts and villa, and you can see if I use the color of the cell to be its type, you can see that um, different cell types are um, definitely spatially organized. So these methods are what um, we've been focusing on, and they, res they um, the data type is very different. It's actually um, an image where you're visualizing um, the actual genes being expressed both within and across cells. So you know, one thing you'd want to do with the single cell RNA sequencing um, methods, one thing you can do is um, take, that high, take that cell by gene expression matrix and then for each cell say, hey, give me a two-dimensional visualization of where that cell is. This is a, so, uh, as a plot of that. This is a T-SNE representation of that matrix. Each point here is a cell. And then a scientist has gone in and carefully um, annotated um, where they think that that cell arises from. In the and this is an example of cells from mouse somatic sensory cortex. So if these annotations weren't here, uh, you'd, you'd sort of just get a bunch of blue dots, and you'd see that they cluster, but it's sort of unclear a priori how to attribute that cluster assignment to some piece of anatomy or some piece of biology. So it's sort of a chicken and the egg problem. You've lost spatial context. You want to say something interesting about these cells. So what do you do? Well, you go and you look into known genetic uh, markers of the regions you're interested in. And then you go ahead and sort of annotate. And um, that's sort of the state of the art for now. Um, so this is data from these new assays, image-based transcriptomics. So I'll walk you through this image. So this is a a sample of somato mouse somatosensory cortex. It's sort of split um, into two here for illustrative purposes. So on this side, this is the raw data. Each point that is, um, is actually an individual mRNA molecule, and it's colored by the gene that that transcript is um, coding for. And we're looking at 14 different genes. And the name of the game here is what I can do is if these cells are properly segmented out, I can attribute each spot uh, to a cell. And then I could get out my beloved cell by gene expression matrix. I can cluster and look for cell types. And that's what I'm showing here. So now um, these are you know, cells in the same sample, but now they're um, color coded according to sort of which kind of cell they represent. Um, and now you also have spatial information. So you're not just looking at sort of gene expression markers for what these cells are, um, but you can actually see, you know, for example, all of these blue cells here in um, layer four of this cortex. And you can roughly start to get a sense of like actually what does the expression pattern look like. It's probably clearer to see down here. You know, these cells are clearly expressing um, different gene patterns than these cells, and they're being called into different types. Okay, so. These um, methods are roughly new. Uh, so, sorry, they're pretty new. Um, right now, they're lower throughput in terms of the number of genes you can analyze in a sample. And um, since it's actually imaging, you're bounded on acquisition time um, using fluorescence microscopy. And at the end of the day, there's, this, um, there's a very tough image processing problem. So your raw data, which I'll come back to, looks like this. And what you want to get out is this pretty picture where you have all the cells cleanly segmented, you have all the spots clearly called, and you have them annotated by which uh, genes the spots correspond to. Your raw data is a multiplexed image. So here I'm showing an x by y um, single plane TIFF file. And across this dimension, which I'm calling the hybridization rounds, um, you're actually measuring the same cells, but you're um, using some multiplexing tricks, given that you only have four or five fluorophores available to index um, exponentially. I think it's hybrid rounds to the power of number of fluorophores you have, number of genes. 
And the, the very simple intuition is if I pick a spot here, that's a, um, you know, my mRNA molecules are represented by diffraction limited spots. If I pick one of those spots and read out its intensity across this axis, that gives me a continuous valued intensity vector. And that intensity vector actually maps onto a barcode. And that barcode tells me which gene that spot represents. So the first problem is, hey, if I have to like align signals across my hybridization rounds, I have sort of a thorny image registration problem. So um, basically what we do is we pick one of those images in this stack as a reference, and then we align everything to that. Um, you can use standard affine registration algorithms. Unfortunately, these images have really, these signals have really interesting properties where um, the sig sample warps in a non-rigid manner um, over the course of the experiment. And based on the amplification strategy to kind of enhance signal to noise ratio, the actual mRNA, R mRNA molecules can kind of spin around uh, and change morphology. So there's like a, a large amount of interesting image processing work here to be done that's domain specific to the, these um, data. Um, and if you can't solve this, you're sort of dead in the water. You might not as well go off to these next things. The next step, um, you know, you can see here the cells autofluoresce. Uh, we're not interested in the background autofluorescence, so we try to filter them to actually enhance out the spots. Um, and then once that done, once that's done, we actually have to find the spots and call them, which is not super trivial. These spots are sort of jumbled um, pixels, and we kind of need to call nearby pixels as one spot. Not super straightforward how to parameterize these algorithms and judge whether they've done well. Um, and then there's the thorny problem of now I actually have to draw boundaries around my cell, the cell segmentation problem. And finally, we get out the image um, that we want to do the science on. So um, at CZI, we were looking at this problem and wondering kind of, well, what are the pain points? Where are people getting stuck? Um, what kinds of tools are they using? So I started off with a collaboration of um, four people generating these data at various um, institutions using different techniques. And we sat down and we looked at the actual data. So on the top left here, we have cell culture data. On the top right here, we have um, human breast tissue data. Uh, bottom left, we have um, mouse brain. This is 3D data and uh, human brain data. And as you can see, these data all look very different. They come in various different shapes and sizes. The experiments were collected under different microscopes and different chemistries. Um, and there's nothing's really super unified here in terms of like how are we going to process these data. So the next thing we did was sit down and say, like, hey, can I see your code? Can I see what your pipelines look like? Uh, and I was surprised at um, how happy people were to, to share this. They're like, oh, no one's ever wanted to see my code before. This is cool. Um, so we sat down and we saw a range of um, different tools being used. A lot of MATLAB. Um, everyone's def definitely using Fiji to visualize their data and actually try filters on the fly and various algorithms. And um, some cell profiler and some Python as well. And the, the key thing we thought at this point was, well, actually, looking at everyone's data and everyone's code, it, superficially, it looks like everyone's doing something very different. It doesn't look like there's hope for kind of unification. Um, but then as we kind of dug in further and further, it actually looked like um, people were doing the same thing. It's sort of like uh, you know, statisticians and machine learning people and um, computer scientists all have a different take on uh, what AI is. But at the end of the day, we're all actually talking about the same thing. It was the, kind of the same thing here. So we thought, hey, is it, um, oh yeah, well, I'll tell you this. Um, the other thing I heard from these people was that they're having really a hard time um, making these image processing pipelines usable, robust, scalable, and standardized. Uh, the common refrain I kept hearing is um, the postdoc or the graduate student that developed the pipeline, after they leave the lab, uh, the next student or postdoc has to basically reinvent the wheel. And uh, you know, our goal is to enable and accelerate basic science research using technology. And we thought maybe this is a place where we can kind of get in and help. Um, with, with our software. And we think that we can actually unify all of these pipelines. And we uh, started this project called Starfish, which is a programming joke. Most of these technologies are called fish something, uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. So star is like the asterisk wild card that, get. OK, yeah. That's, <laughs> you guys are hungry, right? Um, so basically, um, 
Under the hood, actually, we are um, using scikit-image pretty much exclusively for all of the image processing. Um, we have been really loving that, in addition to these um, standard libraries that uh, we, as data scientists, are always accustomed to using. And well, what actually is Starfish? First and foremost, it's a Python library. You can check it out. It lives under the Space TX um, organization. We're very actively developing it. We're working really hard uh, on making an API that's domain specific to these experiments that our collaborators can all use. Um, it's also very coupled to a command line tool, which we'll eventually use for actual pipeline development. Um, these next two we've started exploring. We need this thing to scale. The, for the Human Cell Atlas project, for these data types, we're expecting an order of terabytes of data. Um, so it's been really nice to have a, a former Facebook ad click optimization engineer helping us with this project and with an eye towards scaling out these systems. And then, as you notice, like, these data are inherently visual, so we want a way um, to use modern web technologies to visualize these data. So along these two, we're sort of architecting the system with an eye towards these use cases. But for right now, pretty much all of the development is here. And um, what our sort of plan of attack here is to, um, or perhaps in less bellicose terms, um, the way we're collaborating is um, I can go back with all my collaborators and give them an actual Jupyter notebook, which that they can run on their own data using our Python API and standardized file formats. And so far, that um, seems to be working. People are, are kind of happy with this library as it is. Um, and I can show you some results that show that this actually works. So here is a, a published data set. This is breast tissue looking at 31 genes. Um, each point in here is an actual gene. Um, on the right is um, we process the raw data using starfish. Here I'm actually only so showing two genes, HER2 and VIM. Uh, the, the biology in this paper was that there was actually a cancerous um, boundary that was you could basically call by looking at this differential expression of these two genes. So I'm just plotting the two points. So if you squint, you can kind of see that this image looks like that image. Um, and then, of course, you can get more quantitative. So for each gene, um, on the x-axis is the copy number, the number of times that our collaborator found that gene. So each point is a gene. On, on the x-axis is how many times our collaborator saw it, and the y-axis is how many times um, Starfish saw it. And so these points lie on a line, which means uh, we're sort of very, uh, in a quantitative manner also being able to reproduce their results. This is data from a completely different method, different chemistry, different microscope. Um, we, again, see concordance in gene copy number. And when we actually display what these genes look like in space, they also look similar to our collaborators' results. Um, and so this project has gained a lot of traction. So um, CCI has funded a consortium um, that has self-named themselves Space TX, which is the port. They wanted to call it Spacebook, which we, we didn't allow, I guess. Um, so instead, they made it the portmanteau of SpaceX and Transcriptomics, which I don't understand, but fine. Um, and so we're now basically working with all of the methods developers in this consortium. And we're working together to um, standardize the file formats. We've open sourced all of Starfish. So we're getting contributions back from the community. Um, and it's, been, it's, it's sort of been taking off. So this project went from like me and a for few people to pretty much the entire community. And this is really exciting because this community is so new. We can really get in early and try to shape um, the, the actual uh, software such that it'll work uh, for everybody. And we're going to do this collaboratively. It's sort of not just us at CZI. It's, it's really us collaboratively working together. Um, and if you want to know more about the project, you can um, go on GitHub. That links out uh, to everything you'd possibly want to know about that. And thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, such a great talk. I think I'm, uh, in the interest of time and not keeping you away from lunch, uh, we're going to organize the panel here, uh, give a few minutes to the speakers to you know, have a few bites, and then have them back here up front uh, to get started with the panel. So um, we will reconvene in a few. Let's give them at least 10 minutes, right, and we will be back for the panel. <laughs>